Hello, my name is Fred Weinbaum. I'm the Executive Vice President for Operations and Chief Medical Officer at Southampton Hospital. And welcome to Focus on Southampton Hospital, our monthly program intended to keep you, our communities, informed about your hospital. Our special guests today are Dr. Kevin Brott, an, ot an otolaryngologist, which means that uh, he is an ear, nose, and throat physician, and uh, Dr. Emily Ward, who is a doctor of audi audiology. And I'll let Emily explain what an audiologist does. So Emily, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you're a Southampton native, and you've done some special training. What does an audiologist do, and, and how did you get to be able to do that? Um, an audiologist um, goes through a normal four-year program in college. I actually concentrated in biology. And then upon graduating with a bachelor's in science, I decided to um, pursue the next step. And an audiology degree is what we would consider um, a clinical doctorate. So it's very similar to what um, an optometrist right. or a physical therapist would be. It's that level of right. training. So it's just kind of a step above um, what a, a, a master's would be. And what, what do you do in audiology? What, I what's test your focus? Ears. Yes. <laughs> so, what my focus is basically hearing, um, balance, and um, you know, part of that would be hearing aids. And I understand both of you together are part of a large uh, group of physicians, uh, ENT and allergy associates, that in fact stretch through the tri state area. There are almost 120 physicians or so. And I understand you're doing even, even expanding further into New Jersey, et cetera. But uh, where are your local offices and, and how can people uh, get your services? Well, currently we have uh, two offices on the South Fork of Long Island. One is in uh, Southampton, uh, close by to the hospital, and the uh, smaller uh, office is in East Hampton. So that office primarily serves the eastern part of Sag Harbor, East Hampton Township, and, and all the way out to the Montauk uh, area. Uh, that's, that's great, and um, you know, in, in all those areas, they can see both of uh, both of you. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, hearing is kind of a, an interesting thing that all of us seem to get more and more interested in as we grow older. Um, what what kind of problems do uh, people present with in your offices? Um, typically, patients will come in. Um, and it ranges. Some people don't know, and that's part of the problem with hearing and hearing loss right. is that it's, us it's usually a gradual process. What's that you said? Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a lot of times people will present with um, symptoms like it feels like my ears are plugged or I mm. have wax um, or I miss hearing in crowds, things like that right. will come in and they're not really sure why or what's right. causing it because it's, like I said, it's so gradual. They're not, it's not like, oh, by the way, I woke up this morning and couldn't hear. Well, those, those sort of problems, well, what, uh, what really underlies the cause of those sort of symptoms? What type of hearing problems uh, might be amenable to treatment and what kind of treatments are available? Well, for, for most people, hearing loss, as Emily stated, is a gradual process. So it's, it's normal age-related changes. And just like eyesight or smell or lots of other bodily functions, um, different people's hearing will change at different rates. And there can be genetic components, there can be environmental components, um, say noise exposure in a, in a workplace. Um, so without a hearing test, you know, w there's really no way to evaluate right. someone. So um, primarily, uh, the vast majority of people um, are losing their hearing just because of that's the way they were pre-programmed to, okay. so to, to lose a, their hearing. Sounds like there's a, a genetic component. Absolutely. And uh, an environmental component. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you mentioned the workplace. I know some of our teenagers uh, mm -hmm. may, uh, may have an issue with uh, some of the more enjoyable aspects of life. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we've actually, um, I can remember uh, recently, because it's kind of a new thing, uh, the right. iPod generation, right. for example. Um, and there have definitely been studies done, um, preliminary studies, like just kind of for fun when we've done our thesis projects right. and kind of gotten the taste of it. And um, it's really quite amazing how loud 
people really do listen right. to their music when you right. did like a general study and um, you know that's something definitely to be aware right. of and I try and tell the younger patients that come in especially that are here for other reasons tonsils ear tubes other things that Dr. Brock takes care of if I do get the chance to test any of them I'll always bring that up turn turn the iPod down yeah I think that's good advice for for everyone and and for the parents to help their children to learn that uh, it's capable, one's capable of enjoying music without it being over, that over Without being 100, right. Um, I certainly wish you'd tell all the drivers on the road that that's true as well. Um, now, uh, what kind of damage does that excessive exposure to noise cause and how does that first manifest itself? Well, Is there noise frequencies that get yeah, involved? exactly. Yeah, so certain parts of the hearing spectrum are more susceptible to noise-induced trauma, and that's primarily the higher frequencies. Right. So those will be damaged faster than, say, uh, lower frequencies would. And so people that have this noise-induced hearing loss have this um, perception that certain people are mumbling. Um, I can hear. Um, my coworkers, but I can't hear my wife. And that's because female voices tend to be more in the higher frequency right. spectrum, and that's where uh, noise-induced, and even genetic uh, hearing loss will uh, be more, uh, more, more noticeable. From what I understand you're saying is that these, these high-frequency sounds uh, get lost first when we suffer age-related hearing loss. And I, I've kind of heard about things like that before, even that they've got certain alarms that only children can hear, uh, they're at a high frequency. Um, but when it gets to a certain point where people do become symptomatic, uh, they come in to see you and, and what do you do? What's the next step? Is it a test of some kind? Yeah, the, the first step with any new patient is first they will um, meet Dr. Brat. And Dr. Right. Brat will kind of do a preliminary exam, uh, check for wax, make right. sure that there's no wax inside the ear canal, make sure there's nothing blocking, make sure all the parts are working and good. Okay. And then um, they'll come down to my room and then we will do a full audiological exam. And what, what is a full audiological exam? That How does that happen? It includes... Does it hurt? Does not hurt. <coughs> oh, no, I remember my grandmother who's 88, she got her first pair of hearing aids last year. And um, right. she, I remember her calling me up and going, it didn't even hurt, Emily. I said, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, but typically, so it, yeah, it's a lot. If I'm a patient, do I put, like, headphones on and listen for sound? And Pretty much. We use what's called insert headphones. Okay. They look like um, little earplugs. Okay. And we find that they give a much more okay. accurate reading than the traditional, okay. like, over-the-ear phones. Over the so ear. They're, they're like little headphones that, you would, that I put in. And um, and you you can tell what what frequencies of sound are correct. Are so it would be that that very standard. You know, press the button when you hear the beep. And um, is it a matter of pattern recognition? Mm -mm, no, I and I try, and I can catch people when they try right. <laughs> when they try and uh, pick up a pattern right. um, because there isn't one. I just present right. and go higher, or lower, and I want to okay. see where their threshold is. That's that's the okay. key word is threshold where they just barely hear it. Now. Uh, let me yeah, add it, something it, to that. That yeah. part of the tone the testing we call tone testing. Right. It's only half. That, yeah, that tests how the inner ear is functioning. Right. There's another part to a comprehensive audiologic evaluation, and that is uh, speech audiometry. Okay. And so we want to know how well someone can understand speech. So uh, words are presented at a, at a volume loud enough to accommodate for the hearing loss, Correct. and there's no background noise. Right. And, uh, Believe it or not, people typically don't get 100% of the words correct. Right. And they're okay. simple words like baseball, hot dog, cowboy, school bus. And uh, they're read 25 of those words, and then Pretty they're good. scored on how uh, mm -hmm. many of them they can repeat accurately. If, so let's say uh, someone does have abnormalities discovered. What happens then? Um, well, as we said, the two, there's the two parts to the test. There's the sensitivity to right. sound, so how loud does the sound have to be to pick it right. up? And then the other part is understanding, so okay. how well do you understand? And from there, if you're, um, and I prescribe to the, to the idea that if there's any degree of abnormality, if there's any degree of hearing loss, mm -hmm. whether it be mild or severe, I'm going to recommend a hearing aid because okay. if you're not normal, you're abnormal, and we want you to be, right. <laughs> we want you to be normal. Uh -huh. It, it, you know, hearing is so important. 
Um, it's important for all of our communications that we have with each other. Um, and I think, um, you know, of all the senses, uh, hearing is what really connects us to the world. Uh, so if, if someone is losing their hearing or has lost some range of hearing, mm -hmm. is having trouble interacting with others and restaurants and other places, it can be pretty devastating. How do we treat that? What do we do? Hearing aids, you mentioned, is one type of treatment. What's involved with getting a hearing aid? Um, well, they, again, they would have to, that's part of the next step would be coming in for a demo or an evaluation. Right. Um, I, we would talk, there there's many different types. Oh, yeah, there there's many different, different types. Of types. Of yes. Aids. Um, there are, we primarily work with several companies, maybe three, right. um, that I like, and the reason why I like them is because I get good results from them. I have right. patients that right. have worn them and that right. report back to me that like them, and that's what I use. So, well, that's a um, good reason. yes, and there's different, and there's different, you know, I call them flavors, um, and I will give, usually I'll give patients my recommendation for right. a couple different ones, and then based on their taste, they kind of, Pick what they like, so we—it's it's a of symbiotic. A trial, trial oh yeah, and error kind of da, yeah, yeah. It's a trial and error in the sense that um, once they're fitted, they have to come back a couple times mm. for adjustments because you know hearing is not you know like a, gla like a pair of glasses where you put them on and everything's nice and clear because it's a nerve-related issue. Okay. It takes a little bit of time to adjust, but um, yeah, now, they help. They help drive the fitting and they help drive as much as I do. Now, um, can everyone? get a hearing aid? Or are there certain hearing problems where a hearing aid might not work? Well, you know, there are certain types of hearing losses that are not amenable to hearing aids. Uh, for instance, if someone has complete nerve deafness on one side, right. um, we don't hear much about it these days, but the most common cause of acquired hearing loss throughout the world is mumps. And most right. of our children are immunized, and right. so we don't see mumps-related hearing loss anymore, but right. in other parts of the world there are. and. Um, so typically with mumps, uh, a child would get the infection and completely lose all hearing in wow. one ear. People can be born um, without hearing in one or right. both ears. Uh, people can have acquired hearing losses from viruses um, like the chickenpox virus can cause deafness, much like it causes Bell's palsy. Um, so there's a lot of causes for acquired hearing loss that can damage the hearing system so much that a hearing aid is just not going to work. Um, what do you do then? Yeah, there's a couple of options. If, if uh, the hearing loss is severe and it's in both ears, uh, the only option is if, if the person's a candidate would be what's called a cochlear implant. Okay. And that's a, an electronic device that picks up sound, changes it into an electrical noise, and it stimulates the auditory nerve. Isn't that only for kids or No, that, uh, or? yeah, um, even, uh, even older patients who traditionally we wouldn't consider candidates for cochlear implants are now, uh, are now, wow. could yes. be candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and, if Beethoven and he, was alive today. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he yes, would be. He, would be. he can't um, finally hear the Ninth Symphony. <laughs> and the most common reason why older patients would get it is, 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 is oftentimes it's toxicity from chemotherapy right. drugs I can da permanently damage. And if I they've see. already have impaired hearing, the chemo right. knocks off the hearing the rest of the way. And these are people who already know how to speak. Um, so typically we call that a post-lingually deaf person, and, and they are all candidates. They're, they're good uh, candidates. Yeah, there's no age cutoff uh, uh, right now for that. Now, um, is there ever a time when an external hearing aid is not uh, appropriate? Are there, are there internal hearing aids that people use? Yeah, there's, yeah, exactly. There are some people just because of malformations of the ear. Say, for instance, they were born missing an ear canal or missing the entire right. ear. Um, there's no way to put a hearing aid on that ear. Right. Um, in people who have had uh, bad ear infections, chronic mastoiditis, mm -hmm. draining ears, perforated eardrums, there are situations where the infections are just so chronic and so right. bad that a hearing aid just isn't going to work right. on that ear. And there, are, there is a type of hearing aid uh, that can be implanted. Oh. It's partially implanted. There's, a, there's a, a part that gets implanted behind the ear and then something that looks like a traditional hearing aid actually clips onto the right. implant. And it's a lot like the dental implants that dentists put oh. in now, and you can put a tooth or a denture on it. Right. So the implant goes into the bone, it heals, and then the hearing aid goes onto the implant. So the hearing aid is actually stimulating the, the bone, and the bone is a good conductor of sound, and it transfers the sound to the inner ear. 
And, and, and we can do this here at South Yeah, Hampton. yeah, we've yeah. done it here at South Great. Hampton Hospital, yes. Great. We have a lot of satisfied customers with uh, what we call BAHA, Baja, Bone Anchored Hearing Aid. And then us in turn, we do the programming. So Dr. Brock oh. does the heavy lifting, and then we come out looking nice and rosy on the other <laughs> side because then we turn them on and we make them here. So right. he does so they the thank you. Right, yes. So, and yes, and, it, and it, it's and really they say, it's oh, really he amazing. just made me hurt. And you, you just right. made me better. Yeah. So we're pro we, we do the programmable portion of that yes. device. So the piece that actually picks up the sound right. and does the transmission, we deal with that part and program and deal with the patient. And Dr. Brock, like I said, does, does the actual surgery. Well, that's, that's really terrific. Um, should people get their te hearing tested routinely? We think so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, typically, um, I'm trying to think, like the typical patient that comes in usually is either A, coming in because they're right. just starting to notice it. I said before, it's a gradual thing, so maybe it's just starting to cause some symptoms. They have trouble hearing in a background noise right. situation, or they're noticing the TV's right. going up. Or the other one is, the family. So the family is saying Right. Oh my daughter said that, you know, I keep yeah, missing things on the yeah, phone or yeah. I miss or you know, I'm answering questions wrong. So they'll come in and we might we may or may not find a loss. Yeah. And if we do um, sometimes patients aren't ready for hearing aids, you know, obviously we're going to encourage that they go forth and do that, but, um, or sometimes the loss is very slight, it's mild, and even with the hearing aid it won't do much, so then we say, alright, next year we're going to test you, and the idea is to catch it before it starts to become more and more, right, detrimental. Now let's say you do have a mild problem, um, and you might opt to start with a, you know, a hearing aid, how often then do you have to be retested? And every year. Every year. Every year. Yep. And we, um, we all hearing aids nowadays are digital and reprogrammable. Okay. So, um, you know, even throughout a year, I might, um, a patient might come in and ask me to change the way they're hearing. Dial it up a little bit, will you? Yes, sir. Oh, yes. <laughs> I love it when they say that. <laughs> it's a good. It's a good thing. Good. That's, that's great to hear. Um, what about young children? Are, are they candidates for this as well? Or do you, do you find that you see many children with hearing trouble? Well, most of the children we see that have hearing trouble is, uh, are related to uh, fluid in the ears or right. recurring ear infections. And so there's a whole population of children that, that suffer with this type of a problem. It could be related to tonsils and adenoids, allergies, chronic sinus infections. But for, for the most part, the pediatric patients that we're seeing are different from the adult population. I mean, there's a small percentage of children, but hearing loss is picked up at such an early age now because all children born in the United States right. have newborn hearing screening. Right. So we already know before they leave the newborn nursery if they have a, a congenital um, deafness right. and those children will be treated in more of a tertiary right. setting right. Um, but children that have acquired hearing losses for the most part are related to ear infections and ear fluid and they get managed medically they get hearing tests right. and we yes but very and, few of them need hearing aids. and so if, if there are medical conditions uh, the fluid in the ear the, the decompression of uh, any any excess pressure in the, that environment that will often resolve the hearing trouble that they have. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it definitely needs to be monitored. And, then, and I'll say this to, to parents all the time, right. too, that it's important to get the hearing tested, you know, to make sure that treatment is working and not to just let it go. Because um, I know that, especially with children very young, that maybe just entering school, you know, ages four or five, six, you know, they're learning language. And you can't learn language if you can't hear language. So it's important to, you know. Oh, you know, hearing loss in those and, younger and, children can be devastating. And we can test them, but people always ask, how do you test a, uh, you know, an infant or a toddler that can't really talk and whatnot? And no. we can do it. We have objective measures and okay. we have, um, we do what's called uh, VRA, which is Visual Reinforcement Audiometry, okay. which is actually probably one of the funnest things I do all day. <laughs> we put them in a booth and we uh, play sounds through speakers right. and we light up boxes and we look for them and to we turn. Look for them to yep, and they do right. respond and it's great. It's fun. Uh -huh. it's, it's really cute. The parents are like, what's yeah. going on? Yeah. It's, a, it's a good time. But yep, there's ways to test them. Sounds like they'll want to buy one of those to have at home. Keep right. their yes. child entertained. Yeah, and, the, and it's a soundproof, it's not right. soundproof, it's a sound treated room right. so it's very quiet. So usually the new mothers usually say, can I just stay in here a little? 
a little bit longer. There's, no, there's another population of children that we see, and those are the children that um, may have speech delays, right. Uh, right. developmental delays, and frequently they're referred to us by an early intervention right. evaluation or by the pediatrician because of the speech delay and, you want to exclude. and speech, yeah, is uh, hearing is so integral right. to speech development, we need to make sure that they are hearing right. normally. And uh, there's, uh, as we talked about earlier, there's different parts of the hearing, how well right. the ears work and how well the brain works. Right. Right. And the, the, the catchphrase in pediatrics uh, for how well the brain works is called central auditory right. processing. Right. Right. And they have to be a certain age before we can, right. that testing can be done, but we can get basic, right. Uh, audiometric results, as Emily said, any Absolutely. age, any yep. age, newborn, any age. Um, you know, and I, I know that there's a lot of cooperative evaluations between speech language pathology and audiology to mm -hmm. try to manage those, Absolutely. those children as well as they can be. Now, there's another set of problems that people do uh, present with that I know um, your offices are, are getting involved in. And that is people who have difficulty with balance, gait disturbances related to that, uh, and uh, a whole set of issues, you know, that can even manifest themselves as, uh, as dizziness or something like that. Um, why don't you talk to me a little bit about something called uh, vestibular problems uh, and tell us what does that mean and, and what should we do if, if we suspect that might be going on? Sure. Um, well, first of all, it's important to know that the balance isn't just inner ear. There's right. input from the inner ear, there's input from the eyes, mm -hmm. there's so, what we call proprioceptive how, input. How does the inner ear have anything to do with balance? How, what, what's the ear do, doing? <laughs> well, there's, a, there's two parts to, to the inner ear. One okay. part deals only with hearing, and the other part deals only with balance. Right. And the balance part of the ear is made up of, of three semicircular canals that are oriented in three different planes right. of space and there's sense organs in there. Right. So when there's a motion in a particular direction, hair cells are deflected and the body knows which way it's moving right. and where it's at at all, at all times. And so if there's a, a problem with one of those uh, semicircular canals or one of the inner ears or the auditory or, or the, the nerve that goes from the right. inner ear to the brain, then that can affect your balance. Um, that could be affected by viruses, by uh, uh, um, atherosclerotic disease, from medications that right. people take. Right. But <clears throat> there's so much more to balance right. that it really takes a comprehensive evaluation because, again, it could be related to a neuropathy from diabetes. Right. It could be related to uh, a stroke that someone had that they may not have known they've had. Um, so and medications that are used for treating heart arrhythmias can affect the balance. So the, the inner ear is just one part of it. And we right. work usually with uh, a neurologist and, and and sometimes other therapists to try to right. sort out because frequently these are older patients that have right. these problems right. and they have multiple contributing factors to their balance. Right. Um, and so how can, do you sort that out? I mean, what type of test? Is there any yeah. special testing you do for balance? Absolutely. There, yes, we do what's called a, um, the test is called a VNG, um, right. which stands for Video Nystagmography and Test. How does that work? And that works, um, first off, when any time anyone comes in from balance, we always do a hearing test, okay. A, because the hearing organ and balance organ, as Dr. Brock just said, share the same fluid. So right. we always want to make sure, um, we always get information, like and I said. It's kind of a common nerve. Yes, and it's a common nerve. Well. So as Dr. Brock said, it's comprehensive. So that's where we start. And that balance test is something that we do, usually on a separate day. And it takes about 45 minutes. And what happens is, um, is we do several different parts. I usually tell patients we break it into three parts. The first is a visual test to make sure that the vision isn't causing any issues. The second is what we call a positional test. Sometimes patients will have balance issues and they'll say it only happens when I lay down right. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So we'll have the patients lay down, sit up, move them right. around to see if we can evoke that right. dizziness. And then the third one is, again, another objective measure that tests the nerve right. function of each vestibular organ separately. And I tell patients too that, you know, it's it's a it's a three parts and we're going to test each one separately and um, it's a so you know treatment starts with a diagnosis right we have to figure yeah. out we have to figure out if there even is inner involvement as right. you know because there could be other factors the first thing to do because usually um, inner ear is usually the easiest thing to rule in or rule out and if it is an inner ear issue something that can be dealt with pretty immediately 
I know there are some situations and conditions that affect both hearing and balance, um, you know, certain infections and maybe even certain tumors. Um, are you able to distinguish all that or is that something that you might be asked to help diagnose? Yes, and, and that's part of why we do the audiometric testing before we First, do the vestibular right. testing, because there are certain things like Meniere's disease is a, right. is a metabolic condition that can right. affect both hearing and balance. Um, sometimes people use Meniere's disease to generically refer right. to vertigo, but it really isn't. No, it's it's a specific disease entity. It has to have hearing loss. Yep. Yeah, and um, there are tumors that can occur, as you had mentioned before, there's a, the, the hearing and the balance shares a com share a common nerve. And there can be tumors that grow on the uh, on that nerve, right. and uh, it can cause problems with hearing and balance. And, and those are things sometimes we can pick up the tumor on with the hearing a hearing test. test on the hearing, actually, on the hearing test, yeah. We, the patient would never right. have any vestibular symptoms. Um, and well, that uh, sounds like a pretty important test. Yeah. And, you, and then and, and then there are other symptoms. you had mentioned infections, things like right. you know, tick-borne infections that have become very popular right. on the east end yeah. of Long Island. <laughs> um, Lyme's, Babesia, or Lichia, right. the different um, uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, th those yeah. types of infections can, um, can affect balance and hearing. Wow. I think um, if, if, if it's tick-borne disease, I think everyone will beat a path into <laughs> the office for that test because there are so many of those around. Mm -hmm. right. So um, it sounds like you, you've got children, you've got adults, and, um, and you're dealing with hearing loss as well as problems with, uh, with balance and, uh, and what, what people often refer to as dizziness, what you just referred to as vertigo. Um, you know, this is a tremendous and important service to our community. I thank you for uh, joining us today and discussing it. Um, I would like to uh, thank CTV for allowing us to uh, present this information to you. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for spending this hour uh, with us. Thanks to the crew here, who always does such a fantastic job. Uh, and really, it's, it's CTV that, uh, that broadcasts this to you. And I believe LTV in, uh, in East Hampton as well carries this. So uh, thank you for joining us, and, and thanks to uh, uh, our uh, our esteemed guests, they've done a fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you.